Welcome to A Year of War and Peace. I'm your host, Brian E. Denton. A Year of War and Peace is a daily, year-long, chapter-by-chapter reading of and meditation on Leo Tolstoy's epic novel, War and Peace. In these videos and podcasts, you'll be treated to a free reading of one chapter per day of the novel, plus a reflective essay I've written individually tailored to that day's chapter. These readings are offered for free, though if you'd like to support me, you can do so in one of three ways. First, you could purchase my ebook, A Year of War and Peace. It features the entire novel, plus all of my reflective essays, and it's only $2.99 on Amazon.com. You could also become a patron at patreon.com slash Brian E. Denton. If you sign up there, you'll receive a sonnet once a month, plus a link to an ebook of my collected sonnets. Finally, if you like, you can make a one-time donation to my PayPal account. The email there is brianedenton at gmail.com. You can also use that email to contact me. I'd be happy to hear from you. Your support is greatly appreciated. Today's reading and reflection is on chapter 127. Chapter 127. During that year after his son's departure, Prince Nicholas Bolkonsky's health and temper became much worse. He grew still more irritable. It was Princess Mary who generally bore the brunt of his frequent fits of unprovoked anger. He seemed carefully to seek out her tender spot so as to torture her mentally as harshly as possible. Princess Mary had two passions and consequently two joys, her nephew, little Nicholas, and religion, and these were the favorite subjects of the prince's attacks and ridicule. Whatever was spoken of, he would bring around to the superstitiousness of old maids or the petting and spoiling of children. You want to make him, little Nicholas, into an old maid like yourself, a pity. Prince Andrew wants a son and not an old maid, he would say. Or, turning to Mademoiselle Borian, he would ask her in a Princess Mary's presence how she liked our village priests and icons and would joke about them. He continually hurt Princess Mary's feelings and tormented her, but it cost her no effort to forgive him. Could he be to blame toward her? Or could her father, whom she knew loved her in spite of it all, be unjust? And what is justice? The princess never thought of that proud word, justice. All the complex laws of man centered for her in one clear and simple law, the law of love and self-sacrifice, taught us by him who lovingly suffered for mankind, though he himself was God. What had she to do with justice or injustice of other people? She had to endure and love, and that she did. During the winter, Prince Andrew had come to Bald Hills, and had been gay, gentle, and more affectionate than Princess Mary had known him for a long time past. She felt that something had happened to him, but he said nothing to her about his love. Before he left, he had a long talk with his father about something, and Princess Mary noticed that before his departure, they were dissatisfied with one another. Soon after Prince Andrew had gone, Princess Mary wrote to her friend Julie Karagina in Petersburg, whom she had dreamed, as all girls dream, of marrying to her brother, and who was at that time in mourning for her own brother, killed in Turkey. Sorrow, it seems, is our common lot, my dear friend, Julie. Your loss is so terrible that I can only explain it to myself as a special providence of God, who, loving you, wishes to try you and your excellent mother. Oh, my friend, religion and religion alone can, I will not say comfort us, but save us from despair. Religion alone can explain to us what without its help men cannot comprehend. Why, for what cause, kind and noble beings, able to find happiness in life, not merely harming no one but necessary to the happiness of others, are called away to God, while cruel, useless, harmful persons, or such as are a burden to themselves and to others, are left living. The first death I saw, and I shall never forget it, that of my dear sister-in-law, left that impression upon me. Just as you asked destiny why your splendid brother had to die, so I asked why that angel Liza, who not only never wronged anyone, but in whose soul there was never any unkind thoughts, had to die. And what do you think, dear friend? Five years have passed since then, and already I, with my petty understanding, begin to see clearly why she had to die, and in what way that death was but an expression of the infinite goodness of the Creator, whose every action though generally incomprehensible to us, is but a manifestation of his infinite love for his creatures. Perhaps I often think she was too angelically innocent to have the strength to perform a mother's duties. As a young wife, she was irreproachable. 
Perhaps she could not have been so as a mother. As it is, not only has she left us, and particularly Prince Andrew, with the purest regrets and memories, but probably she still will receive a place I dare not hope for myself. But not to speak of her alone, that early and terrible death has had the most beneficent influence on me and on my brother, in spite of all our grief. Then, at the moment of our loss, these thoughts could not occur to me. I should then have dismissed them with horror, but now they are very clear and certain. I write all this to you, dear friend, only to convince you of the gospel truth, which has become for me a principle of life. Not a single hair on our heads will fall without his will, and his will is governed only by infinite love for us. And so whatever befalls us is for our own good. You ask whether we shall spend next winter in Moscow. In spite of my wish to see you, I do not think and do not want to do so. You will be surprised to hear that the reason for this is Bonaparte. The case is this. My father's health is growing noticeably worse. He cannot stand any contradiction and is becoming irritable. This irritability is, as you know, chiefly directed to political questions. He cannot endure the notion that Bonaparte is negotiating on equal terms with all the sovereigns of Europe, and particularly with our own, the grandson of the great Catherine. As you know, I am quite indifferent to politics. But from my father's remarks and his talks with Michael Ivanovich, I know all that goes on in the world, and especially about the honors conferred on Bonaparte, who only at Bald Hills in the whole world, it seems, is not accepted as a great man, still less as the Emperor of France. And my father cannot stand this. It seems to me that it is chiefly because of this political views that my father is reluctant to speak of going to Moscow. For he foresees the encounters that will result from his way of expressing his views regardless of anybody. All the benefit he might derive from a course of treatment, he would lose as a result of the disputes about Bonaparte, which would be inevitable. In any case, it will be decided very shortly. Our family life goes on in the old way, except for my brother Andrew's absence. He, as I wrote you before, has changed very much of late. After his sorrow, he only this year quite recovered his spirits. He has again become as I used to know him when a child, kind, affectionate, with that heart of gold to which I know no equal. He has realized, it seems to me, that life is not over for him. But together with his mental change, he has grown physically much weaker. He has become thinner and more nervous. I am anxious about him, and glad he is taking his trip abroad, which the doctors recommended long ago. I hope it will cure him. You write that in Petersburg he is spoken of as one of the most active, cultivated, and capable of young men. Forgive my vanity as a relation, but I never doubted it. The good he has done to everybody here, from his peasants to the gentry, is incalculable. On his arrival in Petersburg, he received only his due. I always wonder at the way rumors fly from Petersburg to Moscow, especially such false ones as that one you write about. I mean the report of my brother's betrothal to the little Rostova. I do not think my brother will ever marry again, and certainly not her. And this is why. First, I know that though he rarely speaks about the wife he has lost, the grief of that loss has gone too deep in his heart for him ever to decide to give her a successor and her little angel a stepmother. Secondly, because as far as I know, that girl is not the kind of girl who could please Prince Andrew. I do not think he would choose her for a wife, and frankly I do not wish it. But I am running on too long, and am at the end of my second sheet. Goodbye, my dear friend. May God keep you in his holy and mighty care. My dear friend, Mademoiselle Borean, sends you kisses. Mary. All right, that concludes my reading of chapter 127. I'll now proceed to my reflection on the same. A Year of War and Peace, Day 127. Stumbling Footsteps in the Dark. Imagine you live alone in the country with only your father and your nephew. Your rural situation deprives you of the society of your peers. The object that most approximates a friend in your life is a copy of the Bible. Your two favorite things in the world are your nephew and your religion. Now imagine that your father is an unhinged, cantankerous old man who constantly mocks these two things and, in addition, makes sport of the fact that you're still single. And he does this at every opportunity. That's about the measure of things for Princess Mary now that Prince Andrew has gone abroad. What's her response to this cruel fate? Does she withdraw from family life? Does she react with rage? Does she abandon her responsibilities? No. She forgives her father, 
and she writes a letter of condolence to a friend who just lost her brother. Princess Mary's theory of theodicy, as articulated in her letter to Princess Karagina, like all theories of theodicy, is unpersuasive, but her response to suffering is commendable. Suffering, as the princess writes, is our common lot. The fact can't be changed, but our response to it can. Daily Meditation We should not be angry with people's faults. For what shall we say of one who is angry with those who stumble in the dark? Seneca, on anger. All right, that concludes my reading and reflection on chapter 127. I hope you liked it. Thanks so much for listening. Remember that if you'd like to support me, you can do so either by purchasing the ebook, A Year of War and Peace, becoming a patron at patreon.com, or making a one-time donation at PayPal. The links to all that is below. Your support is greatly appreciated. Tomorrow, we'll be reading and reflecting on chapter 128. Until then, take care of yourselves and others.